Hey, Tori, what's your thinking with uh, having Alec Thomas in there today against the lefty? Um, just a lot of a lot of room out there in center field that I want to make sure we were going to be running some baseballs down. Um, and he actually swung the bat okay against him back at home. I reviewed those at bats, and I just felt like. When you're fighting for every inch on a baseball field, you got to lock down certain parts of it. Defenses, pitching and defense are certainly top priorities for us. And then thinking back to last night, um, what was the strategy with with Castro attacking Garcia as aggressively as he did? Um, well, we definitely had a plan. It, it wasn't executed perfectly. Um, the, there were some balls that were thrown in the wrong space, um, maybe the wrong type of pitch, but. Uh, we, we talked about that at length. If it got down to that level, once we got through the, f the first tier of guys that we were going to use, who did we like against Garcia? And, and Castro certainly was somebody that we all felt very good about. I think it was just a misfired ball in, in a honey hole, and we got to be better. Teo? Uh, on that 3-1 pitch, it looked like Gabby was set up over the middle. Where was the pitch supposed to be? Um, I don't want to give away the, the the pitching strategy, but it wasn't supposed to be a middle middle pitch for sure. No, no way, no way. Once you got to three one on him, was there a thought to, I mean, maybe not intentionally walking, but but being very careful and and trying to get him to chase out of the zone and kind of accepting a walk would be okay there. Um, not particularly. You know, you don't think that a World Series in the bottom of the tenth inning is going to end on a walk off home run. Um, yeah, I do. I do have to think worst case scenarios a lot of time, but I was thinking base hit, walk, not necessarily a home run. So, with one out, of course, I could sit here today and tell you, knowing what the outcome was, we should have and we should have done the same thing to Seager. But you just you don't you don't you don't think that's going to happen. Um, it's a hard thing to do to hit a baseball traveling at 96, 97 miles an hour that's got some good run on it. And if we place the ball where we're supposed to, we're probably going to have a much better result. So um, do I have a regret? No, because like I said last night, I was thinking through it with a very clear head, had a lot of, clear, uh, a lot of good conversations with the staff around me, and no, not one person said we should pitch around him and put him on. Jack, in the middle. Uh, Tori, in your perfect world tonight, um, mm -hmm. do you actually let Merrill go or push him even to go a little further, get a few more outs out of him, protect your bullpen? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, I'll be mindful of how he gets to where that that most critical point is if we need to make a move. And when Merrill gets moving and he, he gets a line moving in the right direction, he, he gets some quick, easy outs. And it's you know, nine, 12 pitch innings. Uh, and I think he started to show that it in, in Philadelphia in game six. There were, some, there were some easy moments. And he got through that fifth. And I think that was where his frustration was coming from, that he felt very good. So what, if he gets the line moving in the right way and the pitch count is low and it's, we're in the right spot, of course, I'm going to press him a little bit for sure. Ron on the left side. Over the years with relief pitchers, what mm -hmm. have you learned about uh, what moments that you think they need to hear some words of support after a rough outing and what times it's better just not to say anything that they don't want to hear it? Yeah. Um, this, this particular area is, is kind of right in my wheelhouse. You know, I feel like I get to know the players. We, we share a lot of really, um, really good information about one another. And, um, I feel like there's certain guys that, that need a pat on the butt. There's certain guys that need a kick on the butt and there's certain guys that don't even want to talk about it. Um, we had a couple of tough moments yesterday um, where relievers who have had a lot of success um, didn't, didn't execute at a high level. So um, <clears throat> I'll read and react uh, based on what I see, maybe have a follow through converse, follow conversation with them at some point. But nothing, nothing today unless somebody wants to engage me because I, I feel like we've, we've all turned the page and flushed it and we got to be ready for this next challenge. Um, in particular, you know, I, I said to Paul Seawald, maybe two words, um, we're, you're, you're still good, we're all good, don't you worry. Um, and Miguel Castro pat him on the butt and, and just said, hey man, we'll get him tomorrow. That, that's where I was with those guys last night. Um, but I know that's sometimes what they need and other guys, they want to basically be punched in the face and said they didn't get the job done and go figure it out. And 
That wasn't the case for us last night. Barry? Hey, Tariq. Um, <coughs> what's your reflection on your first World Series game that you managing? Do you feel like there was more pressure down there? Did you feel like things were going quicker than they might in a regular season game? And you know, when you have the pressure of the crowd building there and the mm -hmm. it, it, it late in the game, I mean, really, probably the Seager home run might have been the loudest I've heard a crowd in the mm -hmm. postseason so far. Yeah, I'll agree with you. When that ball was hit and went over the fence, I'm I've been in a lot of arenas. Um, I've been on 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 a football field with a hundred thousand fans um, cheering. Um, that was easily the the loudest crowd roar that I've ever heard and well deserved um, but I think I've said it here today and I said it last night um, every, everything every every decision I made every conversation I had was done with a clear head um, it didn't speed up on me I just had, at times had to take a deep breath and pinch myself probably pre-game more than anything and, and think this is what it's all about this is this is what I've dreamed about is from being a little kid to right now, um, but you know, just make sure you're you're present and you're here the same way you have been every single day for this baseball team. And that was kind of the last conversation I had with myself. I think everybody does have these little conversations with themselves, different points in time during their their days, their work days. You guys too. Um, so I felt like everything was in a good spot for me last night. I was honored to be on that floor, on that dance floor with 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 my players and sharing that moment with my players, it was, it was special, something I'll never forget. And I did st take, a, take a moment to get on the top step and look around uh, pregame because I didn't want to miss it. I wanted to drink it all up. Uh, let me ask you a question about Seawald. Mm -hmm. um, it, coming over to the National League late in the season, aside for whatever you know, games you had, interleague, I mean, basically, you had the advantage of most of the National League teams were not used to seeing him. Mm -hmm. In this case, with Texas, I mean, they've seen him in Seattle for a while. Right. So they can read him probably better than a lot of other teams. Yeah. Do you think that had something to do with what happened last night? I thought about that for sure. Um, but I know that Paul Seawald, um, the Seager-Paul Seawald matchup favored – Paul, I think he was 0 for 7 or 0 for 8. I can't remember. I, I know it favored him against Simeon, too. But I thought about that, that as I was looking at those numbers, why is there such familiarity? And then the, the reasons are obvious that it's been Seattle, um, Texas, or Seattle, Dodgers, maybe interleague, I don't, whatever it was. Um, but there, there was some familiarity. But I will say that Seeger swung at the ball like he knew it was going there. So that told me that he, he had seen the shape and, and the movement and the rise <clears throat> of that pitch. So we just got to be better. Anthony on the left. You've had some, uh, you know, the old sparky uh, Captain Hook <laughs> aggressiveness yeah. sometimes this postseason. It worked really well for you. Yeah. Last night, third time through, most difficult part of the lineup, you, you trusted Zach. Yeah. I know he's your ace, but given the way the first couple times through had gone, what, what made you so confident in him there? Um, yeah, I think after the third inning, I just watched the body language and, and I you know, had a brief conversation with him in, in the clubhouse about how he felt. He shared the frustration. He, he, he explained to me and was vulnerable in a way that made me think he was addressing what was needing to be addressed. A lot of time you get very protected answers like, I'm good, don't worry. And we, I, don't, I don't have that with our guys. I, I got like, you know, I'm frustrated by this and I need to be better at this. This is what I'm going to do to take care of that. Um, it was very descriptive and deep. So when I watched it happen in the fourth, I knew that there was a really good chance that he was feeling something. And it worked out pretty well. Because you're right, it was, it was a very critical inning for us. I felt like if we got through it, the bullpen was going to be lined up and we were going to win the baseball game. Um, but we needed to get through that fourth inning, and I felt like he was, he was the best guy based on what he gave me in that conversation and what I saw in the fourth inning. Take two more in the middle and the back, and then we'll finish up with Alex right here in the second row. Hi, Tori. Hi. Hi. Um, your offense uses speed and small ball very well. Um, how did your experience and connections in Japan influence your style as a manager? Uh, I, 
I, my philosophy is I have to manage the team that we have, um, and it's always going to be a little bit different. I might have a team in, in, a, in a year or two that can hit three run home runs and, and, and win a different way. But in this particular case, we have a, a bunch of speed and guys that love to execute. So um, I, I will manage them accordingly. What I learned in Japan um, is are a lot of the things that I brought here. You know, it's it's the work ethic and dedication to the very small, small details of a baseball game. Our work habits in spring training, our work habits throughout the course of the season reflect that. Um, I just know during my time in Japan that I became a better baseball player because of what I was being taught and what I was being told. So those are things that we do here. Now, they're not trick plays, they're not gimmick plays, but we practice rundowns. We practice how to tag on rundowns. We practice bunt plays. We, we practice the trick bunt plays. We practice all that stuff because we feel like little things could add up to a big moment and help us win a baseball game. We'll finish up with Alex. Sorry, I know it gets lost with you know, the late game, but mm -hmm. what did you think of your offense's um, execution against Evaldi to get him out? Yeah, uh, we talked about trying to get him out before five. That was one of our overall goals. Um, it was a high pitch count, and I think the third inning, I just think we did a really good job. Once we saw him that first time, we recognized what his strategy was and what the shape of his pitches were going to be, and we made some quality adjustments. So overall, I was very pleased.